Welcome to the React Show, brought to you from occupied Miwok, Numu and Miwok territory by me, your host, Thomas, and a lexical closure. What actually happens when you execute a function? Modern React components are based on functions, but how do functions actually work? Thank you for joining us. I'm bringing this to you from the beautiful Yosemite Valley, which is great, um, but it does come with some mosquitoes. So uh, yeah, if you hear uh, an occasional whine or see me flailing my arms, that's probably why. Uh, I guess either that or a squirrel is trying to eat my recording equipment. I saw one uh, hiking the other day, eating somebody's sweater that they had left out to dry. Um, yeah, so, you know, could be anything, I guess, here, but um, it's, it's really fantastic. I, I, I'm really enjoying my time here, and um, yeah, so today, though, I am super excited to talk about functions and just dive really deep into their mechanics. Like, did you know that you can actually use functions to implement variable declarations like let or const? You don't really even need let or const. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot of other really interesting things as well. Uh, but first, of course, straight from a small pond outside Santa Cruz, California, well-regarded expert on mole salamanders specializing in extra long fourth toes. Welcome to the React Show. Sally, the long-toed salamander, thank you so much for joining us. Thomas, wow, thank you so much for bringing me on the show. I'm very eager to learn about functions. I, I do use them all the time, but I realized I really don't know how they actually work. By the way, how is the sound? I borrowed an abandoned ground squirrel burrow for the recording, but it's dark and foggy outside, so I could wander to another burrow if needed. Hi, Sally. Yeah, it's great. It's fantastic to have you on the show. You sound good. I wouldn't worry. Uh, after meeting you on that dark, rainy day in January, to be honest, I didn't actually think we would make this work. I know you all take a long nap in the dry season and well, nobody could tell me much about how you all live. I certainly would not have guessed you guys have a fiber internet connection down there. <laughs> well, I suppose we are known for being secretive and can't really say more uh, without potentially causing problems for myself, uh, but I'm glad to be here with you now. Uh, but really, I'm eager to learn more about functions. Uh, so what actually happens when React calls one of my function components? How does the JavaScript engine actually execute it? Okay, okay, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. Um, but first, we need to talk about function declarations themselves. Uh, so before the browser or Node or whatever your JavaScript engine is can actually execute a function, it needs to know about the function and what its source code is, right? Oh, yeah, right, that... That makes total sense, duh. But <laughs> see, that's exactly why I need this. I didn't even think about that part. So how does the JavaScript engine like discover functions? I assume it reads all the source code, but then what? Yeah, exactly. The engine starts by parsing the source code with a process called lexing but that's a topic for another day. Once the engine can actually understand the source code and sees a function definition, it has to actually keep track of it, right? Of course, this is where we get into our first data structure. Functions that you declare at the top level need to be stored somewhere for later reference. In general, we call this a binding. 
um, binding a, a declaration to a value, even if that value doesn't get defined until later, in which case we bind it to undefined in JavaScript. We still call that process a, a, a binding or, or that feature. So we need a, a, a data structure that will allow us to store a binding between a function's name and its meaning or definition. Ah, let me guess. Hmm. Okay. So I guess we would want a data structure that allows us to store a number of function names mapped to their definitions. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah. And, and, and while the program is executing, I would guess we want something that makes it really fast uh, to look up these definitions and, and, you know, look up these functions and, and, and get their definitions. Um, does that sound right? Am I on the right track, Thomas? Yes, exactly. We're not going to focus too much on the particulars of the data structure performance here, though, as that can vary a lot and isn't that important for learning the basic concepts and algorithms. They're all, you know, based on the same general ideas. You just optimize things for your architecture, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, we need something like you are describing. Do you have any, like, specific ideas, Sally? Hmm. Yeah, I mean... In JavaScript, at least, I would throw this type of thing in a JavaScript object. Um, they map keys and values, so this seems like a good fit. I mean, basically a, a hash map or, or some structure like that, right? Yes, yes, that is that is what I would do. Um, okay, so we start with a global JavaScript object that can hold all of our function bindings. In computer science speak, we would call this object an environment. Oh, huh. Environment. Why is it called an environment? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know exactly why off the top of my head, but I would guess it's pretty simple. It just holds the execution environment. Oh, yeah. Rock and rain. That makes sense. <laughs> I assume the name of the property or key is the name of the function, right? But what actually gets stored for the the value then? Like, what are we, you know, mapping the name of the function to? Yeah, right. The key would be the function's name. Um, the value can just be the source code for the function if you want. Uh, in a real system, this would probably be optimized a bit more by breaking out the list of arguments into a separate data structure like an array. But on a high level, all that really matters is we store a mapping between the name of the function and its source code or some representation of that source code um, or definition. And to make things simpler later on, we'll just take that optimization now. So we'll make the value be another JavaScript object with the keys being args and statements. The value of args will be an array of strings making up the arguments to the function, and statements can be an array containing the list of source code statements that make up the body of the function. In reality, the engine will actually store the args and statements as tokens in an abstract syntax tree to get fancy here. Um, but again, that isn't actually relevant to learning how functions work. Uh, to make it more clear, would an example help? Yes, 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 yes. An example, please. But, but what about like say in a simple function that takes two arguments, adds the values together and returns the new value. A simple add function, like could, could we use that as the example? I don't know, I'm just trying to come up with something off the top of my head. If you have better ideas, that's cool too. Yeah, totally Sally. Let's define the add function to take two arguments, A and B. The body of the function can be just the one statement return a plus b 
so in our environment object, we have a property named add, and its value is another JavaScript object with the args property mapped to the array with the strings a and b in it, in that order. In the source property mapped to the body of the function, its source code. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I guess it seems pretty simple if I'm visualizing this right. Uh, okay, well, what about when you actually call the add function then? What if I called the, the add function with the arguments one and two, like, like just keep doing our example here. So like adding one plus two, H how does that work, Thomas? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> I know, I know we're, we're going to cover that, but uh, before we get to that, we need to talk about one more detail, frames. So when we call a function, it also creates its own bindings, right? So like we talked about how we were earlier creating bindings in the environment between the function's name and its definition. Um, but when we call a function, it also creates bindings. Like in, you know, this top level, you know, function we've defined called add, we defined the variables a and b. We need to bind, you know, those values, um, one to a and two to b, um, when we call the function. Um, does that make sense? Oh, interesting. Uh, huh. Wow. Uh, so are you kind of saying that there's maybe some way we could reuse our existing environment data structure to store the values of A and B when we actually call the function too? Huh. Uh, I, I guess that kind of makes sense. They are all just variable bindings. Am I getting that right? Yeah, Sally, exactly. Wow, no drizzling way. That's so cool. I had no idea. I never thought of it that way. So function declarations and arguments to a function are really the same thing? Uh, huh. Uh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, it's way cool, right? I love it. I love it when things are so simple and elegant. <laughs> so we could take our environment object and add A and B to it when we call the function the values of the A and B properties could then match the values you call the function with. In this case, the value of A would be one and the value of B would be two. Um, but there's one complication here. What if w one of your arguments was named add instead of A or B? I mean, I know that's like weird, absurd source code in this case, you wouldn't define an add function and then also define one of its arguments to be add, right? Um, but you never know, that's allowed in the language, right? Um, and if we did that and we use this data structure we already defined, we would just be overwriting the existing definition of the add function. So we can't have that. Um, or, or what if, in another example, what if you call the function recursively? we would have the same problem. So we need to extend our solution a bit with what I mentioned earlier, which is frames. Um, so what if instead of our environment being just a single JavaScript object, we instead made it a list of JavaScript objects. And then each time we call the function, we pushed a new object with the function's bindings onto the front of this list. Uh, each object would then be called a frame. So I know this is, is probably all starting to get confusing. Let me explain uh, with an example. We have our environment variable that points to, you know, a list or a, an array, right? Um, the first element in the array is the JavaScript object that we talked about earlier that holds the definition of the add function, right? 
Now when we actually call the add function, we create a new JavaScript object and push it, push it onto the front of the environment list. So now the environment list holds two objects with the second object being the original one containing the definition of add. Oh, I, I think I'm getting it. That is really clever too. So I'm, I'm mostly just famous for my extra long fourth toe, but I do think I've learned a thing or two wandering the outer reaches of techie land here and, you know, at outer Santa Cruz. So bear with me. Let me, let me take a guess here. We then take say the first object in the environment array or list that we just created um, and you call it a frame and in that object we actually map the values of a and b to one and two is that correct yes exactly so just as like a quick recap um, we have a list it or in javascript it could be an array which could be a linked list, could be an array, however you want to do it, right? Um, and the first element in that list is your first frame. And that frame is a JavaScript object that contains the bindings for that frame. In this case, A binds to one, B binds to two. The second item in our list is another JavaScript object that contains the bindings for the top level of your source code. In this case, uh, the add function, for example, and that binds the definition of add, the name add, to its source code, its, its body. So we have an environment list made up of two frames. Oh, so cool. This makes it so the names can't clash then, right? My cousins really should adopt some pattern like this, so I don't need to keep calling them by their numeral anymore. <laughs> yeah, sure, Sally, I don't know about your cousins, but yeah, in, in computer science speak, we technically say it prevents identifiers from clashing. But yeah, that's the, the general idea. Um, but to really put this together, we need to continue with our example. Oh, right, yeah, the example. But one thing that's not really clear to me yet is how the JavaScript engine actually like looks up the definition of the add function. Like it's now in the second frame, right? Right, yeah, Sally, you got it. So let's say we have our environment defined with two frames, which are the two JavaScript objects in our list. First, we search through the first frame looking for the name add, the binding for add. We only find A and B. So then we continue to the next frame. And of course, in the next frame, we find add. So it's Perfect, it works great, right? Um, so really all we need to do to look up any binding, whether it is a function or variables declared in a function, is to search through our environment of frames, starting at the front of the array and working our way to the end of our, our list or array. I should just keep calling it list to make things less confusing here. Um, yeah, so we just search through this list of frames, right? From the front to the end, beginning to the end. If we make it all the way through the environment without finding what we are looking for, we can signal to the user that they're attempting to use a variable or function that isn't defined. And if you've done JavaScript programming, you'll probably do this. Like you misspelled a variable and the JavaScript engine is like, oh, hey, yo, seriously, like you never define this. Well, now we know the algorithm for how that works. It's like, hey, I searched through my environment and I didn't find a binding for this. So I can let the user know. Um, yeah. And so if we do find what we are looking for, we can just return its value. Oh, wow. That seems pretty easy. And I guess that means we can even have variables or functions that have the same names and everything will just work as the programmer intended. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, Sally. Uh, 
yeah, so to, to recap, when the JavaScript engine sees the identifier add with parentheses behind it, it knows that we're invoking a function and it needs to look up the definition of the add identifier. So it searches through the environment and it finds its value. In this case, it also sees our args array um, and it sees A and B in it, in that order. So it knows to expect those two values after the opening parenthesis. Um, it then takes those two values and pushes a new frame onto the front of the environment mapping A and B to their respective values. And now that we've updated our environment with the new frame for the add function, we need to actually execute the body of the add function. This is very straightforward now. We first see A in our statement. Remember our statement is just return A plus B. So we see return and then we're like, okay, what are we returning? Then we see A. So we search the environment for the value of A and return it back. Then we see B and search and return its value. Now we can add those two together and return the value. It's really that simple. Congratulations, we've defined and actually executed a function. Huh, wow, Thomas, <laughs> I really didn't know it was so simple. It always seemed like magic to me and well, I never really thought about it before. So I guess now I know what the overhead kind of is for every time I make a function call, right? Like, I don't know, this seems like a lot. Should I avoid making a lot of small React components then because of the function call overhead? Well, of course, it, it can't be quite that easy, right? Actually, in earlier versions of JavaScript engines, it pretty much was that easy. That's basically all there was to it. And yeah, there was just always a lot of overhead when you called a function. Um, but even, and, and yeah, even now that algorithm is still going to be run at some point. And in some cases it might happen pretty much exactly like that. We call that style of execution an interpreter. But modern JavaScript engines are basically combination interpreters and compilers. So today, the engine might see performance optimizations on that process, like making the identifier lookups faster, or maybe even eliminating the function call to add completely. It might see what we've been doing here, and it might be like, oh, I could do this way faster if I just you know, what's called inlining this function body every time we see the call to add. Inlining meaning we just essentially paste the body of the function into every place it gets called. So we no longer need to build up the environment like we did every time this function is called. Um, but yeah, so comp compilation phases can get complicated really fast, but the same sort of base algorithm that we've been talking about will still be run at some point. It just might not be run every time a function is called, or there might be other optimizations that the system makes to make that overhead a lot less. Um, but as a mental model, you can always imagine how this works and, and you'll get the mechanics of it right. And I think that's really the important part here. And and actually, in a fair number of cases, this is still exactly how it would work. Huh. Well, I'm interested in learning more about compilation phases, but that also sounds like magic to me. Yeah, although, like all good magic, it's only mystical until you understand how it works, right? Yeah, uh, I suppose so, Thomas. Uh, but I'm curious, what happens if you have a function that calls another function or a recursive function? Yeah, great question, Sally. And the answer is actually very simple. We just use the exact same process and algorithm. Every time a function is called, even if you call a function recursively, we just push a new frame onto the front of the environment. And whenever a function finishes executing, we pop its frame off the front of the environment. So the environment grows a frame for every function call and shrinks one frame every time a function returns. Does that make sense? <laughs>
Wow, no dazzling drizzle. That makes perfect sense. And it's so simple. Yeah, and you want to know another interesting side effect of this? Uh, yeah, of course. Keep it coming, Thomas. <laughs> so this process of pushing and popping frames like this, well, it is what creates what we call lexical scoping. If you have ever heard of that term, it just means that you can tell what the meaning of an identifier is by looking at the local source definition. There's another type of scoping that some languages use called dynamic scope, uh, where the value of an identifier depends on the order in which your code executes, and it uses a different algorithm in this case. Um, and, and this is like kind of why it's useful to understand how functions work, even if the actual details don't matter. Because if you understand this algorithm of, of how functions execute, then you intrinsically understand lexical scoping. Um, and, you know, that's always useful, right? <laughs> but, but another really cool thing about this is um, it also will let us explain how let and const work. You can actually implement let just by creating a new function and calling it immediately. I don't know if you ever realized this. In fact, um, when I was originally programming JavaScript, we didn't have let or const, and we did this all the time. It was like, oh, I want a lexical binding, and so I just create a new function and immediately call it. Um, and this works. You don't actually need let to get let in JavaScript. Um, this would set up the bindings for the variables you declare in let, just like let does. Const would be exactly the same, except the engine would mark the bindings as immutable, of course. Oh, okay, Thomas, that sounds cool. Um, but I'm not quite sure I follow yet. So how would that work exactly? Like, you see a let, and you instead substitute in a function call? But like, what is that function called? Like, what name does it have when we create the binding in the environment? How does that work? Right, so let's say we see a let that binds x to the value of 10, for example. All we need to do is create a new function with a unique name that can't clash with any other identifiers that the programmer has declared. We could use many techniques to do this, like choosing names that the programmer isn't allowed to use or something like that. Um, and, you know, whatever works for the situation, right? And once we have a unique name, we can just remove the let from the source code and replace it with a call to define a function where the body of the function, sorry, this is long, where the body of the function is the body of the original let. And then we also immediately add into the source code a call to that new function we created with our bindings. Um, in fact, this would often be a compilation phase or in languages like Lisp, you can do this directly with a macro. You're basically rewriting the source code. You're taking something that the programmer wrote and just transforming it into something that means the same, um, but doesn't like require built-in support in the language or something. So anyways, in our example, we define a unique function that takes one argument named x, and then we immediately call that function with the value of 10. That's it. We don't need to do anything special. It will all just work. And actually, this works with var as well, except var is a little bit weird. Um, whenever we see var, we do the exact same thing, in, except instead of immediately calling a new function with the binding, we instead move or what's called hoisting the declaration to the front of the current scope. So the front of the function declaration or if it's at the top level, the essentially the front of our source code. Um, and so that's, that's hoisting the definition. And then we call that function with all of the variables bound to undefined. Then later on, when we get to the part of the source code where the programmer actually bound the variable, we set the values to the values the programmer declared. 
That might sound confusing, um, but it's still the mechanics of how it works. Uh, you know, the, the order just sort of gets shuffled around. It's, it's essentially the same, um, but things get shuffled around and they might be bound to undefined for a bit. If you're curious, you can look up how VAR works um, to understand it more fully. Ah, wow, Thomas. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, you know, let me see if I'm getting this right. Uh, you've explained a lot of how JavaScript works. Like, I assume globally ava available functions, you know, that come with JavaScript are just defined by default in the frame at the end of the environment list too, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly right, Sally. You're good at this. Another fun fact too. Did you know that this style of storing function call frames in an environment data structure like we talked about is what enables lexical closures where you can return a function that refers to a variable that isn't exposed from the outer function. This allows you to do many really neat things. Like you can actually create your own, um, essentially JavaScript um, like classes without using the built-in class mechanism. Um, in fact, when I, again, when I started programming JavaScript, JavaScript didn't have classes. And this is what we would do to create classes. So, Cause you could define um, values and properties, whatever names you, you know, name things however you wanted and they wouldn't, and you could return that as a function and that function could return, refer to everything you created without exposing it, you know, to the outside world. You could only expose the things you wanted, like your get and set methods or something. Um, so yeah, it's super, super interesting. All the things this enables you to do without needing to have built in support from the language. Um, but it also means, and I guess here's another fun fact. Um, this also means that this style, um, where you're able to return functions and lexical closures and that kind of thing requires a language implementation to support garbage collection of some kind. Huh? Interesting. Wait, so is that why some languages don't support returning functions? Yeah, exactly, Sally. Or why they might have restrictions on the functions that can be returned. Especially if a language doesn't already require garbage collection. Adding support for returning functions um, that ha can have lexical closures can mean massive changes to language implementations. Most non-garbage collected language implementations actually do essentially the same thing we've been talking about with environments and frames and stuff, um, but use the call stack to store all the variables values instead of storing it in a separate data structure, um, which means those values are just gone once a function returns. Um, so if you tried to use a lexical closure in a language like that, things would probably just blow up because the location in the call stack either no longer exists or even worse, might refer to a different value or bytes or data from an entirely different program, depending on how things are set up. Um, but yeah, it's super fascinating. This, this algorithm is basically the algorithm that will be used if your language uses lexical data bindings, um, which most pretty much all modern programming languages that anyone uses, you know, this is basically how we do things. Um, and so, yeah, if you have, I think maybe newer versions of C are coming out with support for, um, you know, returning functions. I don't know all the details off the top of my head, but like in C, at least in most C that's written in older C, it didn't support returning a function that referenced uh, a lexical closure or value defined within that function. Um, you had to define any values it referred to outside of the function. And this is purely because of this reason. It uses the same algorithm. It's like, it, you know, it looks up values in, in frames and, and everything. 
um, but it doesn't store the data in a separate data structure. In languages that do store it in a separate data structure, like say JavaScript, that data, that environment, and those frames might have to live for a long time, you know, until we're done using that function that was returned. So we need garbage collection. <laughs> all right, Thomas, uh, I can't say I fully understand all of that yet, um, but it kind of makes sense. I'm looking forward to learning more about it. Um, let me just, you know, for my own sanity, do a, a, a quick recap to make sure I'm actually getting the gist of this whole thing. So we have one main data structure, the environment, which is a list or linked list of some kind. That list stores call frames. Each call frame is a list or an array that stores the actual values for each definition. Each time we call a function, we push a new frame onto the front of the list, and each time a function returns, we pop that frame and its values off the environment list. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah, yep, you got it. Although, of course, you can use different data structures depending on the language features and optimizations, but that's the general algorithm for sure. You got it. Well, as uh, Norris the sea slug would say, Nito bandito. I love it. Thank you so much. This was so fun. I don't feel like I completely understand all the details yet. That was kind of a lot to get sort of verbally, um, but I do feel like I have a much better overall picture of how functions work uh, or function calls work. Um, and it's really cool learning all the neat little <laughs> side effects you've taught me about, like how you can use functions instead of uh, the language having built-in support for things like let or const or even var in a sense. Yeah, absolutely, Sally. I love learning this kind of thing too. And if you want to learn even more, you can learn about related topics like lexing and parsing. With those tools and this essentially basic interpreter algorithm that we've discussed, you can actually even just build your own language. It's really not too hard. Ooh, I can't wait to try that. I always found these human-based English programming languages to be so cumbersome. If we're being honest, Thomas, I mean, no offense, but you guys are like very imprecise in your language and converting that to source, ah, boy, can be frustrating. I have some ideas. <laughs> great, great, Sally. I, I can't disagree and I can't wait to see your ideas. Keep me updated. And thank you so much for joining us on the show, Sally. Of course, Thomas, and thank you for having me. I had a great time. Yeah, me too, Sally. And... Thank you all for joining us and our look at functions. Uh, if you have more questions or you want to learn more, um, you know, definitely reach out to me. And uh, I am working on some, uh, hopefully it comes out soon. There's a little bit of complications, which I can't go into now. Um, but I am working on some more community features as well. So hopefully we can all join in a big discussion together about functions if people actually care. Or maybe we can talk more about how functions are related to React components or something. But regardless, I hope this was useful. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you once again. Goodbye.